We want to end our study of uh, circular motion by looking at forces in circular motion. When you're thinking of forces in circular motion, think Newton's first law, use Newton's second law. Let me explain. Newton's first law says that objects in motion want to stay in motion in a straight line at a constant speed. So anytime you're going in a circle, you're obviously not moving in a straight line. So that means there must be some force that is pulling you out of that straight line. If you remove that force, you will no longer stay in a circular path. Use Newton's second law to mathematically figure out how much force is required. So let's look at it. Okay, here's Newton's first law. We got an object moving in a circle. We take away the force, the object all of a sudden starts moving in a straight line. You can only move in a circle if there's a force pulling you out of that straight line. Take away the force, you take away the circle. Take away the force, you take away the circle. Forces are required to make you move in a circle. We can see this really well with our minions. We're going to have the minion pulled in a straight line, and every time the car goes around the turn, a force is required to pull him in that new path. If we were to take away the force, he would continue to move straight. Forces are required to make a turn. Forces are required to change direction. How much force? That's where we go back to Newton's second law. Remember, force net means total force. It could be some combination of gravity, friction, normal, tension, or whatever. Or it could just be one of those forces. So here's how you mathematically do this. Most times you're going to be starting with your velocity formula. Again, S stands for the distance traveled in a circle, the arc length. You get your velocity or speed, you plug it in here and you get your acceleration. Remember, this is the circular acceleration. This is the acceleration caused by a change in direction. You then take that acceleration and now you plug it into Newton's second law and you could find out how much force is required, okay, to create the circle that we are experiencing. What is that force? Is it gravity? Is it tension? Is it normal? Is it some combination of them? It depends on what's happening. So here I have an object on a string that is trying to go in a straight line and the string is constantly pulling on it. That is force tension. Here is the direction it wants to travel. Notice, forces always pull toward the center of the circle. They pull you out of the straight line and make you deviate toward the center of the circle. You don't actually head toward the center of the circle because you had built up momentum perpendicular to the circle. But the force always pulls toward the center. Here's a real car going around the circle. Now our force is friction. Friction is what's pulling the car toward the center of the circle. Without that frictional force, the car would continue to go straight. Here are some kids on a uh, amusement ride called the Gravitron. Here it is the wall of the ride that is pushing them toward the center of the circle. This would be force normal. Almost all of your amusement rides have either the wall, the sides, the floor, or even the ceiling pushing you toward the center of the circle. So for most amusement rides, normal is going to be one of the key forces that's going to keep us in that circular path. Finally, if we have satellites going around the planet, a moon going around the planet, or a planet going around the sun or another star, we have force gravity pulling us toward the center. Again, our natural motion is going to be perpendicular to that. 
if we did not have that original motion, we'd just be pulled right into the planet, okay? But we have our original speed, and gravity serves to change the direction, the direction of that speed, okay? So for planets, satellites, and moons, it's force gravity. So I'd like you to test this by solving a problem that we already know the answer to, just so you can see how well all of these formulas fit together. So what I'm going to ask you to do is to calculate how long a year is on Earth, starting with first principles. So starting with the mass of the Earth and the mass of the Sun and how far apart they are, all of those you can get from your reference sheet we are going to calculate the length of the year. So you start by finding the force of gravity. Make sure your distance is the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Get your gravity, put it into Newton's equation. Make sure the mass is the mass of the Earth. That's the one that's going in the circle. Don't use the mass of the sun there. The sun is relatively stationary for this system. Once you get your acceleration, plug it into the circular acceleration formula. And again, the radius you're using is the same radius we had before, the radius of the orbit, the distance from the sun to the earth. Once you get the velocity of the earth, you're then going to plug it into your circular speed formula. And remember that S is the arc length. And in this case, it would be the circumference of the Earth's orbit. Make sure, again, you're using the same radius we use for all the other parts. You're solving this for time. And when you get that answer, it should be in seconds. Convert it to minutes. Convert it to hours converted to days. Depending on how many decimal points you carried it out to, you should be very close to getting around 365 days, which we know to be the time it takes the Earth to go around the Sun. So again, I wanted to show you that these formulas and these ideas actually do match up with things that we are already familiar with. In the future, I'd like to show you guys how we could use this for satellites and also for cars going around the turn. All right, but that's it for today.